So, but what, what I want you to learn today is how to introduce certain styles and style sheets into HTML, um, how selectors work, what the box model is, and what, how units might look like. And what I want you to learn is that there's a separation between the markup, meaning the structure of a site, and the style of a site. And to bring this first thing home, actually, what I'm going to do is, for our website here, I'm going to just remove the style sheet. Right? And that's actually the way I designed it. So because I'm lazy, a couple weeks ago, just before the lecture, I sat down and just designed this as pure HTML. I didn't, e I didn't even have a, a style sheet in mind. I didn't even n know how this should look like. And if we go here, right, it looks like this, which still looks kind of okay-ish, right? And in a perfect world, you would start with your markup, with your semantic markup. And if you have a look at this, then I made sure that everything semantically is okay, right? Just to have everything correct here. So for instance, if you use a table, actually use it for showing tabular data. Don't use it for styling information. Because then it will also look okay on here. Right? And the way that I actually introduce style is by Googling generic CSS. I Googled generic CSS. And I found this here. This is, if we go to this website here, this is some guy's GitHub where he says, oh, you can use my CSS, no problem. Right? OK? There's actually some issues here. Right? But, and what I did is, I, int I just linked, so I used this here. I used this feature called link to incorporate an external CSS into my site. And then it, it, went, from, it went from this to this. Right? And theoretically, if one of you writes another CSS for me, it should still look hopefully OK. Right? And that's, that's the value of ha having the, the semantics encoded into your markup. And so what I want you, want you to learn is, in a perfect world, start with a markup uh, designed for the semantics, and then add the styling information uh, after. The world isn't perfect, so what you will do most of the time is, you have a designer that says, I want this pixel to be perfect right here, right? And in order to do that, you will have a back and forth between the markup and the styling, right? But as much as possible, um, I want you to understand that having good markup will translate into having easier possibilities for the styling part. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, what I also want you to understand after hearing, hearing this part of the lecture is how to apply um, margins and borders and paddings to elements. And for that, you need to understand the box bottle. So maybe, uh, like most of you knew about CSS, who knows about the box bottle? Okay, not as many anymore, right? So I, I think that, that's usually the case. People know basic CSS because it's quite simple to apply. But then the more detailed things are, are probably more difficult. And last but not least, uh, for this uh, basic CSS lecture, I want you to understand the difference between absolute and relative measures. But I'm not sure if we're going to get to this today. Okay, so just an overview. Uh, CSS actually stands for Cascading Style Sheets. And it's been around forever. Uh, it's now in its, in its third version. And uh, you can integrate it into HTML by what I showed you before, just external, externally um, introducing a file into your HTML and saying, I want to I have this style uh, pointed to my HTML. Uh, you can use internal uh, CSS. Uh, let's have an example of that too. You can say, here in my header, I can say style. And I can say, actually, uh, in my body, and this, OK, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself now. But th this is called a selector. And I, I can select an element, for instance, and say, I want to have the background color to be totally black. Huh? Ah, yeah, didn't. Uh, and then there's order issues, obviously. Um, there you go. So now my body is black. 
which, you know, not ideal, but also kind of works. Uh, maybe let's do something else. Maybe let's say um, for all my links that I have that are in navigations, right, like this, I want to have a, a higher font size. I want to say the font size is, um, what's it with, 2EM? 2EM. Great. And no, I don't have the pro version. Okay, and now my links are, are bigger. Okay. So this is another way to apply CSS. Uh, external, we talked about. Um, oh, and then you can actually just go into certain elements. Let's say this theme and overview is important to me. I say style. Uh, that should have a different font family. It should be, um, I don't know. Huh? Monospace, sure. It should be monospace and it should be, uh, should be um, let's say, uh, 5 EM. It should be huge. Then just this element, team and overview, will have this particular style. Now, this here is actually frowned upon. You can do it, but I would say the only time you should do it is when you're experimenting. When you actually want to try something out and see whether this applies to certain things, I would do that. But if you want to have uh, a centralized kind of, kind of um, uh, guided styling, I would only use either this here, and not even this, I would use external style sheets, style sheets right? Because they, then you can collaborate with different people on different things. And then also, the style is not attached to the actual markup in, 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 in the same way. So you have a separation of, of concerns. So what we're going to talk about in, the, in this course is CSS3. And CSS3 is the newest version, and uh, someone from the working group even said, this is not going to be a CSS4. CSS CSS3 is already perfect and great. And the nice thing about 3 is it's fully backwards compatible to, to version 2. And it gives you a lot of interesting things. Uh, the main things we're going to talk about is uh, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The first four things, right? So we're, we're not going to go into full CSS. If you want to know all of CSS, I urge you to self-study because one course would not be enough to study all of CSS. It's, it's pretty big, actually. But the basis of CSS we can do in, in the next five minutes. Okay. Oh, actually, because last time everyone wanted to leave, is there a restriction you, you want to leave at 45? D who has to leave now? One person. Okay. Is it okay if we do another 10 minutes? Yes? Not everyone, but almost everyone. Okay. <laughs> okay, so for CSS, uh, what we already kind of saw before is that you have a thing called a selector. And selector can, uh, can have uh, different things, but usually what, it's, uh, what it says is um, it targets a set or one specific element in your HTML, right? So if you look at the, at the type selector, uh, in this case H1, it says apply this style to all the H1s in the document, right? The ID selector says apply this style to exactly one element in the document, the, the element with this ID. And the class selector, I think that's the most used selector actually, is apply this uh, to all the elements in the, in the markup that have this particular class. And that works with the dot. So if you say, in this case, you say dot small, then you apply everything uh, to the who has class small, regardless, regardless of the elements. If you want to restrict it to the element, you say p dot um, small, for instance. And then there are additional selectors that, that are sort of interesting. Uh, you ha can have descendants. So if I say body p, which is kind of redundant, it says all the p's that are directly uh, that are in the body. If you say body greater p, then it only applies to paragraphs that are uh, direct descendants of the body. So if you have a body diff p, it wouldn't apply anymore, right? Um, then you have siblings, which rarely used, I think, but sometimes maybe, yeah. Um, and, and you can specify based on attributes. You can say, give me all the headings of the first order uh, with, the title, if, with the title, that's the first one, or with the title that is equal to something. Right? So you can be very specific in your selectors. And then in CSS3, you have even more selectors. 
uh, you can say, uh, give me um, every second child, or give me the first of the type X, and so on and so forth, right? And because it's so complicated, there are tools out there. If you Google for them, there are tons of them. This is one example called uh, specificity, where you provide uh, this um, selector, and it provides an explanation for you in natural text. Right? And then we have some standard properties, I would say. I, I call them standard because they, they, they come up uh, almost every time you want to design something, right? Uh, the first thing is text. I think oftentimes we want to we don't want to have the standard text. We want to specify a certain text you want to have within a document. And then you have uh, all the font things, font family, style, size, weight, et cetera, et cetera. Right? You have a lot of those things. Uh, you have background. Background can, can be a color. It can be an image. You can repeat the image. Uh, you can position the image within the background. There's all sorts of things you can do with the background. Um, if you Google for it, you can also find how, find how to style the background with a certain gradient. Right, so you can have a gradient from, let's say, uh, blue to red, even. Then um, lists uh, are painted with a background with a um, OS UI. If you want to want to have the lists look a certain way, then uh, use the list style type, list style image, for instance. And then what comes up very often actually is you usually need to to specify a border for certain things. And the border is also important uh, for the next thing we're going to talk about. Uh, namely the box bottle, to differentiate what certain things are, right? Now, sizes and proportions are something I'm going to go into next time in a bit more detail. But just so you know for now, there are things like absolute sizes that are always the same, things like centimeters and inches and, and, and points, right? So those are absolute values you can use. And one centimeter will be one centimeter wherever you look, right? Where, where, on your phone, it's going to be the same as it's going to be on your desktop computer as it's going to be anywhere else, right? It's one centimeter, right? And then we have relative values. Now, relative values are, are definitely more interesting because they can scale to different sizes of, of inputs, but also different sizes of, uh, of your browser window, OK? So um, I think the important ones here are sometimes percent, but percent is relative to the parent, so beware of that. Um, and the, in, the interesting ones for text are actually EM and REM. Uh, EM uh, stands for uh, a relative measure to the font square that you're using. And I don't think we have enough time to go into detail on that, but, but be sure that next time I will explain uh, this in, in um, a couple more slides because it's actually important. Uh, a lot of times if you look at websites, especially from the early 2000s, they use Pixel, what you, what you see up there. Pixel is a very bad measure for those things because it doesn't scale up and down the way you actually want it to. So a lot of times when you look at best practices for introducing fonts and font measures, it's uh, using EM, for instance. And then there's this thing I've never used, but I saw it and I thought it was interesting. It's called calc. Have you used this before? You have? OK, I, I've never used this. Uh, like a month ago? OK. So Michael has used it before. I, have ne I never have, where you can actually calculate between different measures. Right? You, can, you can subtract pixels from, from EMs, which I think is insane, but apparently it works. Okay. But again, this is just an overview. I, I want to talk about that next time a bit longer when, when we talk about responsive design. And here comes the box model. And that one's actually important. And uh, with that, I will actually close for today probably. But I want you as homework, uh, maybe go into your favorite HTML editor, uh, open um, or insert a div and play around with things like margin, padding, border, and, and uh, what else have we? And maybe see how the height and the width of the elements changes. The, the basic idea here is that if you have a block element, you have the, the general content inside. Then after the general content, if you add a padding as a CSS property, then the padding is what be comes before the border. And that's why it's important to actually have a border, because if you don't have a border, then the margin and the padding co uh, collides, and it looks like the same, right? And you, you can't really distinguish it. But if you have a border, you will see that the padding is the distance from the text or the internal elements to the border, and the margin is the distance between um, the border and the outside elements, OK? And this is the box bottle. 
It's not actually too complex if we explain it like this, but I would urge you to actually go home and try it out and try, try different things with margin and borders. And to actually close this lecture, a quick word on positioning. Um, you can position things uh, within the browser in certain ways. And uh, positioning can be absolute and relative. Absolute means, I can tell you, uh, put this box 20% from the left, right? And it puts it all the time over there. That's something that you, you're not going to use a lot unless you're going to use something like animation, right? Uh, what's more interesting is relative positioning relative to other elements, okay? But all these things here together with uh, floating, I think are more important when we're going to talk about responsive design next time. So until next time,